Good evening. Uh, please take your seats. Thank you. I'd like to call to order this uh, Shanghai County Board Committee of the Whole, Tuesday, June 10th at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Schrader? Here. Schwartz? Here. Alex? Yes. Berkson? Yes. Carter? Here. Cowart? Present. Esri? Here. Harper? Here. Hartke? Here. James? Here. Jay? Here. Kibler? Here. Langenheim? On board. Maxwell? Here. McGuire? On board. Michaels? Here. Mitchell? Here. Petrie? Here. Quisenberry? Here. Richards? Present. Rosales? Here. Kurtz? Here. We have a full house tonight. Oh, nice. Uh, I'd like uh, approval of the minutes, May 15, 2014, please, uh, Mr. Mitchell, Max, and, and Stan. Um, any changes or additions to the minutes? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'd like a motion approval of the agenda. Addenda, please. So moved. Uh, I have uh, Geraldo and John as a second. Uh, go ahead. Chris, you have a... Something for the agenda? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move item J1, which is consideration of the MPA contract for nursing home management services to immediately follow the nursing home monthly financial report. Uh, that will leave item I6, which is the county administrator's salary recommendation for non-bargaining employees as the last significant item on the agenda, and I will give fair warning that I expect that to involve a closed session. Okay. Any objection? Okay. I didn't know get the whole thing, but I'll get it in a minute. <laughs> all right. Any other changes? All right. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Nice. A resounding aye tonight. And no empty seats. Uh, we have public participation. I have one uh, esteemed former county board member, Mr. Steve Mosier. Would you please take the podium, sir? I guess I'm here to talk about the recorder and the clerk and what you're going to decide about putting that item on the ballot. <clears throat> I've appraised farmland in this county and adjacent counties for 40 years. And I can tell you this recorder's office is the best run one in, the, in central Illinois. I spent hours and hours in Ford County looking at books that are handwritten with a legal description and trying to figure out who bought what and who sold what and what they paid for. And the assessor's office and the recorder's office in this county are so far ahead of their time with the rest of this area that uh, you just don't know how good you got it, and I don't know why you want to change it. I don't think you're going to get any benefit out of it other than getting rid of the recorder, but I'm not sure that I know Barb's done a great job, and there's somebody else going to come along that's got a broker's license, has been in the real estate business, that knows how to do that. And I think Max Mitchell probably concurs with me on this. That it's <laughs> it's it's just so much easier when you can come in here and get on a computer and find comparable sales and legal descriptions that are not handwritten like I write. It's terrible. You can't read it, and it's almost like the dark ages when you go anywhere but Vermillion or McLean County in this whole area when you're trying to appraise something. So I'd, I really question what good it is going to do this county to try to merge those two offices. Because that is a big operation in the recorder's offices. It's got one of the biggest volumes of transactions that there is in central Illinois. and. Uh, the people in there are fantastic about being 
nice and helping when when you can't find something and when you're a computer illiterate like I am, it's nice to have somebody that isn't. And I could say the same thing about the assessor's office. It's just a piece of cake to come in here and try to figure out what a piece of farmland is worth uh, here versus Pyatt or Ford or Douglas or any of the adjacent counties. Thank you, Steve. Is there any other public participation at this point? All right, I'm closing public participation. Communications from the board. Are there any? Uh, I have a couple. Uh, you'll see a letter from Chad Hayes to me today. It's on your desk. Uh, concerning the report that the property tax relief bill for the tornado, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's not on my desk. I'm sorry. I ha it's not on your desk. I'll just read a quickly passage from uh, Chad Hayes. I'm writing to report that the property tax relief bill, uh, SB 3259, amendment number four, for small businesses affected by last November's tornado has passed both the House of Representatives and the Senate and is now on the governor's desk awaiting its signature. The bill passed in the House as amended Thursday, May 29th. The Senate concurred with the amendment on Friday, May 30th. The amendment is a small change that only pertains to Cook County and the manner in which property is categorized. Also limits the disaster that this bill covers to tornadoes. There were changes requested by the House Revenue Committee. I've enclosed a copy of the final language for your review. The language is identical to the language contained in my last correspondence with the minor changes noted above. It is my expectation that Governor Quinn will sign the bill into law within the next 90 days. A letter encouraging to do so would, <coughs> would, to do so would most certain, certainly be in order. Thank you for your support in this matter. I'm pleased that we're able to navigate the bill through the legislative process, hopeful that the new property tax threshold will be as helpful as business in Champaign County rebuilds. Let me know if I can be any further assistance. And uh, as per his request, uh, I have sent, uh, I'm sending off a letter to uh, Governor Quinn. Uh, I'm writing in support of SB 3259 for four small businesses affected by last November's tornado. I'm hopeful that this bill will assist businesses in Champaign County to rebuild. Thank you for your support. Any other communication? Thank you. Astrid, Justice, Social Services. Uh, mental Health Board report. Peter Tracy. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, the I think you have a document that should be in front of you that uh, that I prepared. Uh, it gives you a little bit of background about the activities of both the Mental Health Board and the DD Board. Uh, in terms of our funding and planning uh, for the coming uh, contract year. Uh, the last two pages, the attachment A and B, uh, are spreadsheets that show exactly where all the money uh, went, the contracts went. It's about $6.5 million worth of contracts. Uh, but I also thought you needed to have a little bit of background concerning how we got to where we, uh, we are and how the decisions were made. One of, the, one of the points that I, I think is important, and this is on page one, is that all of the systems that we deal with are in incredible, going through incredible changes at this time. On the mental health and the uh, substance use disorder side, the primary changes are really related to financing. We are moving into, with the, with the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and Medicaid expansion, uh, we're, we're, we're moving into a, man, a, a system that will be managed by managed care companies. Uh, so the community mental health system that we, as we know it now, is going to be changing. One of the big changes will be that, that uh, the providers uh, the, the, that the managed care companies choose, uh, I think it's going to be broadened and th there'll be more participation. Also in this county, uh, there is a, a special pilot that's um, in a four county area uh, related to children's mental health that is run by a managed care company out of Indiana that's called Choices. And the, uh, the, 
the purpose of this particular program is really to manage high end care for children and adolescents in need of residential or psychiatric hospitalization and that's that's essentially what they're going to try to control choices has two contracts one with the department of children and family services and the other is with hfs the state medicaid agency to manage all of the uh, uh, medicaid programming for those kids on the developmental disability side if you look at the bottom of page one i, I list about uh, 12 different things that are affecting intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, I'll touch on a couple of them. One of them is the Liga's consent decree. Uh, and this, is, this relates to people that are in large congregate settings, uh, the, what are called the ICFs, uh, intermediate care facilities. Uh, and the big shift here is, is that people are going to be moving, uh, that people are gonna be given the choice of having uh, residency in four person or under uh, community integrated living arrangements, or, or as we call them, SILAs essentially a house in the community, four, four people or less. Right now the system is really either the, the ICFs or the eight bed SILAs are, are sort of the standard. The entire system is gonna be moving toward the, to the, the smaller uh, SILAs. Other areas related to intellectual and developmental disabilities that I think are important to, to know that where change is coming uh, has to do with the Illinois Employment uh, First Act, which is just, uh, actually, I, I understand the governor has issued an executive order today or, or that just was posted. Uh, and, and that has to do with the uh, kind of moving away from the sheltered workshops uh, in, and the congregate uh, segregated uh, uh, centers for people that have disabilities uh, and integrating them into the community. So these, a lot of our decisions were really predicated on some of the changes that we know are happening, that are gonna happen, that are just around the corner, uh, and those are listed there. I also have, um, if you start on page two, I identified the areas that we identified as priorities for the mental health board, and those included things uh, like we have, a, we have an agreement with the developmental disability board that, that earmarks a certain amount of percentage of money uh, that should go for developmental disability services. We talk about the access initiative, sustainability, that's the uh, state, federal, uh, local partnership uh, for youth services. Uh, behavior, behavioral health programs for youth um, with serious emotional uh, disorders, and that includes the parenting with love and limits, as well as the uh, money that we manage uh, for you, that the quarter cent for public safety, which is used to, to fund the assessment center that uh, is currently operating now. That money, actually all the money in the quarter cent that we manage now goes to RPC and it's all going for the assessment center at this point. Uh, there also is, the, the other area of focus is the, that I think you should be interested in, is the, the issues of mental health and the criminal justice system. And we have, in the last year, revamped most of those services. Uh, that con continues to be a priority. Uh, then on page three, uh, you'll see the priorities related to um, the developmental disability side. Um, and those go on for several pages. Most of them have to do with, em with employment uh, services, um, uh, children's services, flexible family support, um, just a, those, are, those are the targets that we were focusing on. On the top of page six, uh, there are what we call the overarching considerations, and those relate to uh, underserved populations, primarily making sure that minority populations are adequately served by the systems, which they haven't been traditionally, uh, trying to make sure that we have countywide access uh, to, to services, um, and, um, Anyway, those are the, those are the uh, overarching uh, areas that we that we covered. We also have a section following that on page six that has to do with the access initiative. Uh, this program is, as you know, is ending on September 30th of 2015. So we're moving into the last year uh, at at this time. Uh, this will probably be the last full. Well, not probably. This is the last full contract. Uh, year four access initiative and so we're in the process now of looking at a sustainability plan working with our community partners to come up with uh, with plans 
Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's going at this point. Uh, the next thing under that on the bottom of page six is uh, this gets back to uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, there is a huge problem with SILA capacity. Those are the community integrated living arrangements uh, in the county. We have, that we know of, uh, approximately 20 people that live in Champaign County that have received awards from, from the state to pay for their SILA placements, and there aren't any available in Champaign County. So what we're proposing is an RFP to try to jumpstart that process, and uh, that RFP is, is issued in, in online. I actually want to thank uh, Deb Busey and uh, Van Anderson for their assistance. Uh, they, they did an incredible uh, format for RFP, and we uh, used their format, and uh, I think it uh, worked out very well. Um, the last thing I would mention is uh, uh, another area of partnership in the community. You've heard of the 211 uh, line, which is the information and referral line uh, that uh, uh, we partner with United Way to, to fully fund that particular program. And um, the, the last two pages, as I said, are att attachment A is the, the mental health board funding. Um, I can, I don't know, maybe you might have some questions at this point, but you can see we, we issued uh, from mental health board funds $3.4 million. Uh, the quarter cent money uh, is $240,000 in six twelve, And then the federal money related to the access initiative is at the bottom of that page, and that's $500,000 for this last contract year. The next, the next page is all of the Developmental Disability Board contracts that we have, which total uh, 2.9 million, and that does not count the additional uh, 547,000 that the Mental Health Board uses to fund uh, developmental disability services also. So that's really the total there, that's everything. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yeah. Thank you for presenting. Um, question, can you explain just the different tiers and what they represent on your budget? Sure. Um, if you um, go down the uh, column to the left, that's, those are the names of the agencies that we fund, and then the specific contracts are the next, uh, are, is the next column over where it says programs. Uh, tier one are the kind of the uh, uh, what we identified as the highest priority. You'll notice uh, that all of the things related to criminal justice, mental health are are listed in under tier one. Uh, tier two are all of the uh, programs that fund that we use as match for the access initiative. So all of those contracts there in tier two, uh, uh, that's access initiative. Uh, tier three are the lower priority programs that, uh, not that they are not important, but they're not in our high priority area. Tier four are all the, the, are all the programs related to developmental disabilities. And then tier five were the ones that we received applications for that were not funded. So you can see all those. And then the last column over where it says approved, those are all of the uh, programs that were funded were approved for funding. And we're in the process now of, of uh, doing contract negotiation and, uh, and the contracts will be issued uh, effective July 1. Thank you uh, for the report. Um, um, one observation and, and sort of one information question. Uh, the observation I've already shared with you, I attended uh, the meetings when the grants were being discussed uh, for both the Mental Health Board and for uh, the uh, Developmental Disabilities Board, and it was a, a very impressive uh, collaboration between staff and the board and what you gave to the board to help their decisions. But one of the things that I did notice is a tremendous amount of overlap between needing um, 
firsthand conversation and information between the two boards and an overlap of the people who have an interest in it attend. So what I uh, shared with Peter was my observation of wondering if there was not, a t the time had not come, where those boards ought to be considering meeting together to be a little bit more efficient in their decision-making process because what happened was um, some of the grants could not be decided upon by one board. They had to go to the other board and then go back. And so just that, and I wanted to share that with everybody else. And then the second is um, about mental health and mental health facilities. You're very well aware that we're wrestling with the issue of jail expansion, and part of that jail expansion is to um, um, have spaces for people who have mental health problems, and that's sort of being pushed down on the communities from the state level and then from the federal level down. And when I read what the plans are in McLean County, they seem to be in a very parallel situation with what they're working on over in McLean County. So that causes me to have an inquiry. Is there anything collectively being done by the different agencies in the state to put more pressure on the state to reopen some of the mental health facilities that have been closed over time so that counties don't end up adding beds in jails where these people really probably are not um, supposed to be, but in a care facility that can really focus on their mental health, uh, their mental health issues. I, I, Patsy, I don't really know of any pressure to move in that direction. I mean, the pressure is moving away from that. At, at this point, most of the beds in state facilities are forensic beds, um, and I, I think that the, the civil beds are pretty much gone at this point. Uh, so, I mean, the trend around the country is to close them down. So, um, and, you know, I... Peter, can you speak to this lack of availability of these Scylla homes? Do you, what do you think the issue is there? Is it simply, I mean, it's a relatively new program. Is it not enough people interested in being providers? Is it the providers aren't getting paid enough? Is it zoning issues that are making it difficult to start, or community opposition that's making it difficult to site the homes? You know, what, what's, the, what's the issue there? Well, the issue, I think, is that um, because of the consent decree, and by the way, for any of you who are interested, tomorrow afternoon we're having a study session uh, about Ligus, and we have the court monitors going to be here. But that has put tremendous, I mean, ju just that influx has put tremendous pressure on the system to create additional uh, SILAs. Um, so that is, that's one thing. And, but I think that the other is, is that for the last year, we've had people, citizens of Champaign County, come here and talk about that, first off, that there isn't a Scylla available here or that they've accepted a Scylla that's, you know, in Dixon or, you know, some, you know, there, there's one, one woman that came and she drives to Dixon three times a week um, to see her family member that's there. So I think that we've, I don't think, we've come to the decision that we think from a policy perspective, we think anybody from Champaign County ought to be able to live in a Scylla in Champaign County. Um, why haven't they developed them? Well, I think first off, you know, the, just the uh, the quantity, of the number of people that are presenting, is one reason. But I think the other is is that the uh, the investment uh, in in either leasing or purchasing the houses is is another major uh, stumbling block. I think that people are right now scared to death about the the, the um, state situation. Uh, I mean, as you know, we have, a, I think, a six-month budget. We uh, have no idea how that's going to play out. So I, I think there's, there's just a lot of trepidation about, um, you know, trusting that the money's there, even though there is a consent decree and, and, you know, the governor's made a commitment. But I think that those are some of the factors. Uh, in doing the due diligence on the RFP, one of the things that we did, we talked to the court monitor, and I also talked to the to the person who's re responsible for re rebalancing, uh, which is essentially getting people out of the state-operated facilities. 
um, that works in the governor's office, um, and they both thought that this was that this could be a very good thing to to just kind of jumpstart the system. That remains to be seen. We're hopeful that it that it does the job, um, but I, those are those are my what I think are the major reasons why we're having a problem getting that going. Thank you, Gary. Gary. Peter doesn't mind, I'm going to add a little bit something to his presentation. I have talked with one provider, and that provider is very concerned about the efficiency of staffing a four-bedroom cell or a four-person cell versus an eight, and that seems to be one of the major uh, drawbacks, at least from this individual uh, provider, is that it's, uh, the efficiency is just not there on a four-bedroom, and he's quite concerned about being able to fund it. Thank you. Yep. Hi, just one one more question. So I noticed, again, I haven't really had a chance to really study this too much, but just kind of learning where our tax uh, dollars are going. Um, it looks about 20% of the mental health board funding is going to one program, specifically Parenting with Love and Limits. Can you describe the process that you use to determine which programs get what apportionment of funding? Is it all based upon uh, grants that are received? Can you kind of give some guidance as to how much, how you decide what to appropriate to which program? Well, uh, that depends. We, we have a notification of availability of funds. We typically have not done RFPs. And so we, uh, providers, you know, we identify what we think are the needs and then providers submit applications. The Parenting with Love and Limits is an, you know, is an expensive program. Uh, it um, was, the, and the reason that we went with that particular program was that we were funding a lot of different programs that were supposed to be serving kids with mental health issues that were in juvenile justice. And we were getting very bad results. Uh, you know, especially in the area of engagement. So we l began looking for uh, an evidence-based practice. That's what this is. It's, a, it's an evidence-based practice uh, that uh, I saw. I went to a, a conference of state's attorneys and judges, and they did a presentation on this particular program, and they had a, a, an engagement rate of about 80%, which was pretty phenomenal, I thought. So uh, we, we have a committee, the one that manages the quarter cent money, which includes uh, Joe Gordon and uh, Julia Reitz and a variety of other people. Uh, at that time, we talked about this program, and that, so we vetted the program. Uh, uh, I think Joe Gordon made calls to some of his contemporary, some of his uh, uh, counterparts in other areas where this program was operating, and, and we basically got very good results on that, and uh, that's, how we went with that particular program. It's an interesting program because it, and we actually have, I think that there's some opportunities that weren't there a couple years ago that are, that are there now uh, that have to do with the possibility of using Medicaid to, to expand the number of kids that are served. Uh, but uh, at, you know, the, the major thing I can tell you is, is that we've had uh, pretty good results and when people in the juvenile justice system uh, are happy with the way it's performing, I think, you know, that says a lot. So that's, 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 that's how we got with that particular program. But most of the time in terms of how we make decisions, it has to do with um, um, whatever the priorities are. That's why there's so much of our money is tied up in the mental health, criminal justice, juvenile justice. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I've asked you many questions throughout the years, so I'm not going to ask you very many, and I'm not going to put you on the spot tonight. But uh, speaking of, uh, about parenting with loves and limits, uh, there's $291,000 with community elements, and then there's 291 dollars with the Prairie Center. How is that being juggled? Uh, is it then almost $600,000 for both? That's correct. Okay. Uh, and that, um, this program, uh, there are two parts to Parenting with Love and Limits. Prairie Center has what is called extended care, 
and that's for kids that have kind of penetrated fairly deeply into the juvenile justice system. And the, the other one at Community Elements is, is a front-end program that is for kids that, that are either station-adjusted or have kind of a minor run-in and you're trying to deflect them from the, from the juvenile justice system. So the, those are the two programs, and the, the, they're, they're staffed uh, pretty similarly. Uh, we have three master's level therapists, full-time, fully dedicated at, in both of those programs, plus a person that works directly with the families in both of the programs. So uh, that, you know, it's, um, I, I like the program as a funder because uh, it, we don't, you know, we, we have 100% of all the staff we, we can look at, we get all kinds of good data about what they're doing. Uh, it's not like some programs that we fund where you have a point, point two five of a FTE and, you know, so you're splitting your staff with all kinds of different other duties and functions that makes it hard to track. But that's, that's, the, that's the rationale for where we are with this program. Anyway. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any other comments? Move to accept and put on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. Moved. Put on file. Uh, Reentry program? Is somebody going to come? It's in the packet. Oh, it's just, okay. There's a report in the packet. Uh, okay. So the reentry program, animal control, emergency management, Head Start, probation, public defender, and veterans assistance. Uh, any discussion? I know Patsy said there was not a public defender file posted, but it will, we'll get it for April. We will get it posted very quickly. Uh, Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay. Madam Chair, there's nothing to determine whether or not to cancel. Oh, program. yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Patsy? Oh, uh, yes. I, um, I had a question. You slipped past the reentry program report. Yeah. And you and Jim McGuire are the county board members on that uh, committee. Do you have anything that from the, uh, the committee meetings that you've attended that you um, would be helpful to report to the board? Um, it's early. They're still, you know, trying to decide uh, who, the, trying to decide the whole program. It's uh, only been in effect, what, three months? And uh, th there's not really an awful lot to report, except that people are working very hard on it. Okay. Uh, do we want to cancel the July meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. It passes. Anything? No consent. No. Uh, James. Where's the cat? Mm -hmm. uh, in my office. I can run and get it for you. Okay. Okay. He wants that gavel. Will, He's will got you be his able? Fetish about my gavel. I'm not sure why. All right. Good evening. <laughs> Tonight we have uh, a bundle of appointments to get through first. Um, to uh, respect Mr. Langenheim's request, I'm going to take them in order one at a time. Um, first one we have is a, an appointment for the Bailey Cemetery Association, uh, three terms from uh, July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman, your nomination. Thomas Barnhart, Gary Fisher, and Michael Frizzi Jr. are my appointments. Mr. Esri has seconded. Are, is there any discussion? Ms. Petrie. Uh, well, it's a collective question for all of the appointments 
uh, to the cemetery board and cemetery associations. And I sent a question in uh, asking about the terms that are noted here on our packet. Uh, when I read the statute, the terms are staggered, and these terms are not staggered. And so I wondered if somebody um, could check on these so that then they could have final approval um, during our county board meeting. And um, I, I, when I read the statute for um, cemetery boards, I um, had trouble discerning exactly what was the staggering uh, for uh, the term uh, times. That, that wasn't very clear in that statute, so I'm open for assistance on that information. Thank you. Well, if, if we can't discern exactly how the staggering is supposed to be based on the legislation, what are you advocating that we do? No, I said it was only for the cemetery board. It's very clear for cemetery associations. Ah, okay. Two different statutes, two different number, sets of numbers per board, and uh, so far there are a couple of, uh, I think it's one board and one association that isn't up to uh, a full uh, membership on the board according to the requirements of the statute. All right, I, I don't know, Ms. Busey, is there anything that we can do about staggering these? Well, I believe the statute allows for half of the Cemetery Association board members to be um, um, appointed to a six-year term of office, and they're supposed to be done three years apart. So doing three at one time for a six-year term is not a problem under the statutes. The problem is how these have historically been done so that you have you don't have another three necessarily all expiring in another three years. And that goes back for decades where if a position was vacant for a while and they finally found someone to take it, they just appointed to a six-year term. And historically have always made these appointments to six-year terms. So I understand that when you look at the whole entire listing, we don't have three ending in 2020 and three ending in 2017, which might be ideal, but there's no, uh, there's, you are not violating the statute if you appoint three at a time to six-year terms because that's actually what the statute says, that half of the association would be appointed at each time. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next, for the Clements Cemetery Board for one term running from July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Cecil McCormick. Changes my appointment. Second again by Mr. Esri. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Also unanimous. Next is the Locust Grove Cemetery Association, two terms running from July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Gregory Burr and Marsha Fisher, uh, two appointees. Second. Seconded by Mr. Kibler. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next for the Mount Olive Cemetery Association, uh, three terms running July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thomas Gordon, Robert Trumbull, and Jack Knott are the appointees. Second. Second by Mr. Esri. Questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, for the Prairie View Cemetery Association, three terms July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman. Carpenter, Mark Shaw, and Clark Wise. Second. Second by Mr. Schrader. Discussion? Mr. Mitchell. Just, I was just curious, uh, Clark Wise has a mailing address in Effingham, Illinois. Thank you. He has a family member who is in this cemetery, which is, it's either or, resident, or you have a family Someone member who's interned it. Someone residing in the cemetery. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so he's, yeah. Okay. 
like it. It sounds like a comfortable way. But, uh, <laughs> That's why I need the gavel. Thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> any, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Passed unanimously. Uh, next, the Yearsley Cemetery Association, one term, July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2020. Mr. Chairman. I have uh, Philip Nigg. Seconded by Ms. Michaels. Discussion or questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Passes unanimously. Um, moving on, uh, next we have the Forest Preserve Board for a term from July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2019. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, wa I want to preface, there's two boards here that had uh, a difficult time in choosing an applicant. Uh, the applicants, these two applicants for extremely, uh, have extreme experience in this area. Uh, their resumes are uh, both astounding. Uh, and I, I interviewed both of them extensively on issues now and issues in the future. And uh, I've come down to choose Bobby Roberta Herkovic as my choice for the Forest Preserve Board. I hope you will concur. Seconded by Mr. Kibler. Do I have any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. All right, next, that motion passed, but not unanimously. Next, we have for the Board of Health, two terms, July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2017. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have two, Michael Raffato and jo John Peterson. Michael Raffato is a dentist, and John Peterson is an MD necessary for this Board of Health. Second. Seconded by Mr. James. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Passes unanimously. Finally, on the appointments we have for the Del Developmental Disabilities Board, we have one term, July 1st, 2014 through June 30th, 2017. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Again, I want to preface, this is one of the most difficult choices I've had to make in my tenure as chair. Uh, there are four excellent, excellent applicants. They're all emotionally tied uh, to these programs through their family members, and uh, many of them have extensive backgrounds. Uh, what we did was, and I'll give you a quick uh, update on what happened here. I sat down with Peter Tracy uh, and the staff of the uh, Development of Disabilities Board, Mental Health Board, and we posed uh, a group of questions, uh, eight significant and important questions that dealt with issues like the Ligus Decree and Siller Housing and, uh, and Employment First and all of the issues that are now uh, being compounded and changed uh, uh, through a number of these uh, decrees. Um, we spent more than an hour with each member of these, each of these applicants, more than four hours, Peter and I both were in on the questions and the answers. Uh, after we went through this extensive interviewing process, we sat down and made a composite rating on a five-point scale for each question. We went over each answer where we felt it was important that they understood the issues, where they stood philosophically on distribution of dollars and the future issues that were about to take place. And so we ranked each single question by one to five. And we came out with a clear winner in my, in my estimation. Ms. Deborah Rausch will be my appointee for the Dif Disabilities Developmental Board. Seconded by Mr. Maxwell. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor Thanks. say, up, oh, Mr. Maxwell. Um, I want to uh, reiterate what uh, Chairman Kurtz has said. These are all fine quality people. We have two terms, two appointments coming up next year. Yes. And so I hope that uh, these folks will consider uh, applying again next year. And I, I definitely thank all, all four of them for applying. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it. Other comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. nay. 
Motion passes, not unanimously. That's it for appointments. Now we're gonna move on to the county clerk section. I would entertain a motion to accept and place on file both the May 2014 report and the semi-annual report. Mr. Langenheim, seconded by Mr. Harper. Any questions for Gordy? He's here. Gordy, would you join us? Astrid has a question. <clears throat> Microphone, please. It's about the ENS error in the elections. And in Will County, they had ENS come in and do a complete audit and find out and tell everybody what the problem was. Uh, is it possible that you could have them come here and do an audit to also? Um, everything from the March primary is now sealed per statute. So but we did a complete audit before we made our results official and we have discussed this problem, the ballot design problem and the resulting impact that it had on our uncontested down ballot races um, at some length and publicly and repeatedly. And I understand that um, that there are some people who are never going to be satisfied with those explanations, but... Wasn't there emerging er error also? Emerging error? Yeah. Uh, if there is a merging error... Emerging error? Yes, after you uh, redid them and merged the new results with the old results. Um, there was an issue with with the merging of results and some software issues and, and it impacted Will County. And it, you, you had no mer merging problems with, with the recount, merging the recount with the original. We have documented no problems in merging of retabulated results with election day results or any other results. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have any questions about the stuff that's on the agenda? No. Nope. Thank you. Mr. Kibler. Mr. Holton, just kind of curious, given that we were open an extra day last uh, week uh, to convert civil unions to marriage, just kind of curious if you can provide some numbers on how it went and just kind of give some guidance on how many have converted over and so forth. So we were open Sunday, June 1st, as that was the first uh, date for the marriage equality law in Illinois. And we were open um, from 1 to 4 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, and we were open for all marriages all marriage licenses. We were also open for same-sex marriage conversions. I know that, that the fact that we were open for everything sometimes got lost in the story because of the new law. Uh, there were 42 couples who showed up on Sunday afternoon. Um, 41 of them were same-sex marriage conversions. The vast majority of them were Champaign County couples. We had a half a dozen couples or so that were from other counties that weren't gonna be open on Sunday afternoon. We were pleased to be able to provide the service. Um, since then, we've done an additional I don't know, I'm guessing a little bit, but 20 or 25 same-sex marriage licenses and, and our normal business, our normal spring business for marriage licenses in Champaign County. We are seeing, I think, still uh, a large number of out-of-state same-sex marriage licenses. All right, any further questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richards. Just wanted to follow up uh, on Astrid and clarify. So you're saying... That, that there were no mer merging errors found post-primary. I mean, so we sorry, talked about this, I think, for 45 minutes or an hour at the April County Board meeting. And the questions that you asked, we certified the results that the machines provided to us. We don't go in and do manual manipulation of election results for obvious reasons. So... So that's, so that's a no. We have documented no errors with merging or anything else since, since there, other than since the ballot design problem, which we talked about publicly, which we retabulated results transparently in collaboration with the State Board of Elections, in consultation with the Democratic Party chairman, the State Board of Elections. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you, Gordy. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the reports and placing them on file, say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay.
All right, moving along to county administrator reports. Um, first, I would like a motion to accept and place on file the May 2014 administrative services report. Uh, Mr. Rosales is seconded by Mr. James. Um, Deb, do you have anything to call out? Are there any questions for Deb? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Passes unanimously. Uh, next up, uh, we have a uh, job content evaluation committee recommendation for the county clerk director of training position, um, which we sent to them last month. Uh, I believe the recommendation um, does change the classification of this position, but uh, in, it will not have a significant a salary impact because the incumbent who I believe retired, right, um, resigned, um, was at the top of the other classification, where whereas a new hire in this position would come in in the new classification at a lower salary rate, which is close by, right, Deb? Yes, I'm, in all likelihood, the the salary, the budget salary would not change. Um, and I would also point out that this is really a new position. Um, it has some of the responsibilities of the previous executive secretary position, but is, assumes a lot of additional responsibility as well. Thank you. Patsy? Uh, just a clarification on the budget impl uh, implications. Are you talking for the remainder of 2014 or are you speaking ahead to 2015? Well, whatever is established in 2014 carries forward with that employee's salary into 2015. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course, that, de that depends on how fast that can be filled, too. Other questions? Mr. Maxwell? Um, do it, uh, well, uh, this, there's, is there a high possibility or uh, probability that this will be filled in house, or will we have to go out into the general uh, community and, and see if we can find some folks there? Mr. Holden, do you have any idea about that? We intend to post it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All those in favor say aye. Order, there's no motion on the table. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. I, I, I would need, yes. Mr. Schrader has moved that we uh, act on this recommendation. And I get a second from Mr. McGuire. Discussion. More discussion. Okay. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes. No, not necessary on the, uh, the chair does not feel that that is required. So next on the agenda, uh, we have uh, job content evaluation recommendations for positions and administrative services. And if, if you would, Deb, would you give a brief overview of the outcome? Yes, and the memo is um, with the finance agenda items, handouts that you had tonight. It was also emailed out yesterday. Um, basically, we have two positions. They uh, previously titled the executive assistant to the county administrator and the HR generalist position. For the executive assistant to the county administrator, uh, we are acknowledging that that title has probably not been the best title for this position. This individual has always been um, extremely engaged in budget management and um, budget uh, preparation, including salary administration, which is an HR function. Um, this proposal would uh, have the, this position keep all of the responsibilities it previously had for budgets and salary administration, adding to the responsibilities um, workers' compensation claims management on behalf of the county, which is, again, another budgetary responsibility more than anything else. We would be removing um, supervision of staff from the position with this change, and the recommended new position title 
is budget and human resource specialist. The classification remains the same in um, grade range J. The second is for the uh, HR generalist position, which this re recommendation is basically for the elimination of the HR generalist position as it was previously constructed. Some of the responsibility, that of the workers' compensation, just went to the um, budget and human resource specialist. A majority of the rest of the HR functions were administrative in nature. Um, and so the recommendation is to create a position titled executive assistant to the county administrator, which will assume, which will assume a number of administrative um, support functions for the county administrator and deputy county administrator, which we really previously had not had assigned to an assistant. This includes, um, you know, supporting extra committee meetings, scheduling, calendaring, um, provide, and this is not for standing committee or county board committees, but extra committees that evolve just through the operation of administration. And then also assigning to this position um, some of the administrative HR functions, which um, include um, job postings and state and federal and state labor postings for county buildings, assistance in EEO documentation and reporting, and coordination of the annual employee recognition event. Uh, the recommend, recommended classification for this new position is in grade range H, and the HR generalist position was previously assigned to grade I, so that is actually a reduction. This position would currently be considered to be vacant because the HR generalist met, left the employment of the county on May 2nd. All right, do I have a motion to act on both of these recommendations? Mr. Alex. Second. Seconded by Astrid. All right, um, any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes. Let's see, um, moving on to other business. Um, it's under the chair's report, okay. These are, uh, yes, they're in both places, so I'm moving to the chair's report. Um, due to uh, a fairly um, underwhelming support on the county board for looking at moving the, eliminating the recorder's office, and the complete absence of champions in the community to take such a thing on the ballot and support it uh, for passage, which would probably be required. I don't intend to bring this up further. I'd like to say that Mr. Moser convinced me to do that, but I had already made my mind up before <laughs> I heard him speak. But I do appreciate him coming out to say something. Mr. Mitchell. Um, well, I think since it is here, I mean, you can withdraw, but we might as well vote on it and take it take it off the table. Uh, it's not it's not an, on the agenda for an action item. Okay. It, okay. I just wanted to let people know where that was. Okay. I hinted that that's where we were going last last month. But Mr. Kurtz, uh, thank you. I, I fully support uh, James's uh, uh, motion here to withdraw this. Uh, I I haven't gotten any emails or phone calls or just about any kind of comments on combining this, so uh, there isn't uh, a will out there because any kind of referendum is gonna take work and education uh, to teach the public, and we just don't have that, that kind of enthusiasm out there. So I support uh, James's position on this. All right, uh, the other thing under the um, chair's report is I, I was again asked to consider uh, looking at potentially a trial uh, for uh, adding uh, telecommunication participation to our rules and instead of making a permanent change, bring it on as a trial because there was a lot of um, concern about how it w would work and what, what the impact of it would be. Um, I put it on here to get, to actually do more of like a straw poll to see if, uh, how many people would be willing to approach this as a trial as opposed to a permanent um, rule change. Otherwise, if there's not enough support in a straw poll to do that, then again, this is something else that I'll just let go. 
Um, Mr. Kurtz, do you have something to say before yeah. I conduct yeah, I'm this just report? How, how long um, a test do you, what are you planning on? Um, that would be something that we could determine, but I think the, the thought was it would have to be um, anywhere three to six months. Six months would probably be a good good amount of time to try something like that, but uh, that's something that we could determine through discussion. Ms. Michaels? What about the parameters of this trial? I don't, I don't know what they'd be because that was part of our discussion is not everybody was agreeing how this should happen or how, how it should be handled, and so therefore there would have to be parameters set in order to have this trial if we had it. Yeah, and I'm just trying to assess interest in going down that path. So again, parameters would have to be determined through discussion and uh, voting on it. Ms. Petrie. Uh, I understand your uh, desire to have a straw poll on this, but as I mentioned in caucus, my takeaway from the previous conversation is twofold. One is a resistance to do this at all, and second uh, was a willingness to do it if there was not a per diem connected with it. So in the straw poll, I think we need to differentiate those two aspects. I, I don't believe that there's any need to do that because we can't have one without the other. We can change bylaws. No, no, the, the state's attorney has advised us that we cannot do that. Oh, it's state statute? Yes. So um, if, if you are willing to entertain the discussion of doing this on a trial basis, please raise your hand. That's the information that I needed. Thank you very much. All right, so um, next thing under the, the chair's report is uh, I would entertain a motion to cancel the July Policy Personnel and Appointment Committee of the whole meeting. Second. Mr. J. Mr. Kurtz seconded, and I will now entertain discussion. Mr. Kibler. Just to clarify, any items that would have been on that agenda would automatically go to the full board, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does not mean that we will not conduct business. It means we'll just do it once in the month instead of twice. Other discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Nay. The motion passes. Um, let's see. For uh, consent. I have A1 through 6 and 8. Um, let's see, B doesn't matter. That's it. Everything else we were able to act on on our own. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, please take the chair. need to bring your computer? Oh. We're not going to do this electronically. We're going to do it with paper. Chris. Yeah, old I'm, school, huh? I'm disappointed. Works for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Makes me feel comfortable, you know, with paper. I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to the finance portion of the Committee of the Whole. Uh, we're going to do things a little differently this month and start off with budget amendments and transfers. Uh, the first item on the agenda is Budget Amendment 14-23. Uh, $215,139 $215, $215, uh, from the Access Initiative Grant of the Mental Health Board. Uh, I would ask for a motion to send this to the full board with a recommendation so of approval, and I got one from Mr. Kurtz. Is there a second? Ms. Berkson. Uh, since Mr. Peter Tracy is here, I'm sure he'd be willing to speak to this if any members of the board had questions as to the timing. I also included some information from Mr. Tracy in my memo. Any questions? Mr. Kibler. Mr. Tracy, I do appreciate you, you sticking around for this portion. I uh, just had a question regarding the appropriation and the revenue side. Uh, please correct my, uh, my knowledge with respect to access initiative and where it's funded. I, I thought it was a purely grant-based funded program. Is that incorrect? No, it is a grant-based program. It is a, it's actually a, what is called a cooperative agreement between the federal government, the SAMHSA, and the Illinois Department of Human Services and, and us. And uh, 
in this situation uh, the we got unanticipated carryover money from the previous year my understanding is some of it was money that DHS did not use and basically we put a plan together and uh, they accepted the plan and we uh, spent the money and it wasn't part of the last year's process the money so this is all grant money it's not tied to anything related to the any county money or levy uh, it's but that's can I ask a clarification then for for Deb then why would it indicate then that the revenue wouldn't come from a grant as opposed to from fund balance because the grant revenue has already been received in a prior in either this fiscal year or a prior fiscal year and was already budgeted so we can't increase the revenue budget because it's already there Ms. Michaels. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Tracy. I think you just told me that we received this just recently. I think it was in March. Which was after the budget. That's correct. Yeah, yeah this was money that was not budgeted because they didn't know if they'd get it. Right, but, I, I'm, but the revenue was anticipated. The actual authority to spend it is a carryover. If I can ask. Absolutely. My understanding when I was talking to you is that you didn't know whether you would get this or not, and then until you got it, then that's when you decided what you were going to spend it on and what you were going to do. That's correct. We did not know that we were going to get it or how much it was going to be. Then the budget amendment should be amended to reflect that there's $215,139 in new revenue as well. Thank you, Mr. Kibler. That just clarified it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with the understanding that this will be brought back to us at the full board meeting, may I have a recommendation to send this to the full board with a recommendation? I'm sorry, we already have a motion. Uh, all in favor of sending this to the full board with a recommendation for approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you, Patsy. We'll keep this off consent. We'll look at this again. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Tracy, for being here. I will move on to Budget Amendment 14-24. This is increased appropriations and increased revenue of $37,950, uh, receiving United Way funding to support a temporary home visitor for early childhood Head Start. May I have a motion to forward this to the full board with a recommendation for approval? Ms. Court and Mr. Langenheim. Uh, Ms. Michaels. I need to recuse myself from the voting because I was a part of the board that uh, approved the distribution of the funding being on the United Way board. Thank you, Ms. Michaels. Uh, any other comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing none, all those. Mr. Kurtz. Uh, Diane, I want to thank the board for, uh, since I have you here, uh, uh, thank the board for the additional funds. Uh, it's always helpful when we work with uh, the children to get as much funding as we can. So please send my uh, thanks to the entire United Way board. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz, and thank you, Ms. Michaels. Any other comments, questions, or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That will go to the full board. Moving on to Budget Amendment 14-25, $200 received as a gift from AFSCME, for which we thank them very much, uh, to help sponsor the 2014 Health Fair. May I have a motion to send this to the full board with a recommendation for approval? Ms. Michaels and Mr. Hartke. Uh, any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Finally, budget, budget transfer 14-5, $435 among various budgets to accommodate the approved salary increases for elected officials for the month of December 2014. Uh, may I have a motion to send this to the full board with a recommendation for approval? Mr. J. May I have a second? Mr. Esri. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Court, go ahead. Uh, um, it's to accommodate the, the new sale, no, it's for the end of the current fiscal year. It's, two, it's fiscal year 2014 money. Okay, so it's the increases that we approved previously, which will go into effect on December 1st. 
does that I'm sorry, does that answer your question? I mean, it, it's it's a it's to provide the money to pay the salaries where we decided to set them at the last meeting, and it's for the county clerk, the treasurer, and the sheriff. Mr. Quisenberry. And the reason this change is needed is because we're changing our fiscal year this year, correct? That's correct. Normally, when, when the fiscal year started at the same time as the increases took effect, it could be just built, just built into the next year's budget. But here, the increases take effect in December. The budget doesn't start till January. Ms. Busey notes that that will, will continue in the future. We'll run into this. If we change salaries, I mean, obviously, only every only every two or four years, but we will run into this because if we change salaries mid-year, the budget will presumably not reflect the increase. Okay, any further discussion, comments, or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That motion carries, will not go on consent. We'll move on to the treasurer's report. I um, may have a motion to accept the treasurer's report and place it on file. I heard a lot of people, Mr. Kibler and Ms. Berkson. Uh, treasurer is not in attendance this evening. Um, may I have any comments, questions, or discussion at this point? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. The auditor is here tonight. May I have a motion to accept the auditor's report and place it on file? Mr. Stant James and Second. Mr. Quisenberry. The uh, main thing I'd like you to notice is the collection of property taxes is reflected on this report. So our revenues appear to be up at this time because that first installment was due during the month of May. And uh, we'll have a little bit more when we give you your June report next month. Thank you, sir. Any comments, questions for the auditor? Uh, that looks like a no. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, any comments or discussions among members of the board? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. We will move on to the nursing home monthly report uh, that was provided to the board in our packet. Um, you have given an opportunity for Mr. Max Miller, Mr. Maxwell or Mr. Harkey to make a comment if they so choose. Uh, if not, to entertain any questions or comments on the nursing home report. Mr. Harkey. Or, sorry, excuse me, Mr. McGuire. May I have uh, a for, Thank you. May I have a motion to accept this and place it on file I'll first? I'll make a motion. Mr. McGuire and Mr. Langenheim. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, McGuire. Just a couple of different things I noted. Uh, legislation that talks about increasing um, funding by $5, which should help the budget of the nursing home. Um, and an email from ASME indicating the prevailing wage, wages of the employees. Um, there was some discussion last time that and taken reference to the nursing homes report. Um, hopefully that will help the budget of the nursing home. So, Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Anyone want to elaborate on that or speak to that? We do obviously have contract negotiations going on with the union representing the nursing home, and those, the comments that Mr. Uh, Wilmore sent are certainly uh, a factor in the, those negotiations. Any additional comments or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now we'll go to item J1. Uh, this is the approval of the contract with MPA for nursing home management services. Uh, there's a draft copy of, the, there, excuse me, there's a final copy of the contract. Uh, it was provided tonight. This was also emailed out to board members on June 6th. Um, I have a motion to forward this to the full board with a recommendation for approval. I see Mr. Harkey's hand go up. Anybody would like to second this? Ms. Berkson. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions or comments or discussion. Ms. Petrie. Uh, yes. Uh, there are two um, that uh, I would like first, before I make a motion, to hear why they were not included in this contract. And depending on that answer, I'll decide whether I want to uh, make a motion to... You can't amend a contract in a meeting. I can't? No. We have, this is a negotiated contract. You can't move an amendment. Okay, I still want to ask the question why it isn't in included. And it's on page uh, 12. It's 2.1C1. And all that's mentioned there under that primary goal is um, the bylaws. And I'm wondering why isn't, uh, aren't the policies I'm sorry, Patsy, can you point us to that again? 
page 12. Oh, well, let me make sure that yeah, that's we're not, the we're not case. finding that. Sorry, sorry. I was reading. I was taking it off what I was reading before. Um, you can use the copy that was handed yeah, out tonight. Uh, we'll all be on the same page. There. Okay, it's on page four. No, that's contracts. Uh, page seven. Primary goals. Uh, down at the bottom, number one, and it. Um, talks about just the nursing home board bylaws and does not include the nursing home policies. And I'm curious why that was not included. So you're asking why you're, you're speculating it should include reference to the nursing home policy book. In addition to the bylaws, yes. Because the, the bylaws are important, but the policy document is really the, the driver for the board of directors. Yeah, I think that's reason. I think that's a reason. I think that's a good point. I mean, the reason it's not included was because it wasn't included the last time and nobody proposed to add it. Um, I think that is something we can, I think that's something that we could take up. Mr. Maxwell? Um, I'm wondering if the mission statement is in both documents. It seems to me this is just referring to the mission statement, it, which may, is probably in the, for sure in the bylaws, but I'm not sure it's in the policy without uh, going back and reading that. Thank you. That's, do you understand what he's saying, Patsy? That the, yeah. the paragraph says, implement the mission of the CCNH defined in the nursing home board bylaws. So the question is, is there, is the mission, is the mission that that refers to I don't included know. in to, its totality yeah. in the bylaws? Wait, they have to look at that. I don't know that answer. That's, that's, I mean, I think we see where, I think we see where, where you are going with this. Okay. I mean, we'll take a look at this between now okay. and the full board and determine whether we think that needs, whether we think that needs to be added or not. I, I'm sure it's not anything that MPA would have an objection to. Okay, and then my second point, um, now this is on. Um, I'm sorry, let me, I'm gonna get Mr. Kibler here in case he has something to say. To, do you have something to say to that point? No, actually just. Okay, let me let Ms. Petrie yeah, continue and then we'll get to you. Thank you, Ms. Okay, Petrie. Okay, thanks. Um, on this new copy, it's page four, it's 2.1B6 contracts. And um, unless there was a change from what I read previously, there's no um, reference in here that the board of directors um, are, is informed before the fact on contracts. It's just a reference here that's all after the fact and I'm curious why it's configured that way. I, I think the intent is that the nursing home, is that MPA, will keep the nursing home board apprised of contracts prior to the time that they expire because in the past there's been concern that the nursing home board did not was not aware of contracts and the times it was not aware of I mean there are there are many contracts in place with vendors at the nursing home and the concern was that the nursing home board of directors was not perhaps getting adequate information as far as what what those contracts were and when they were about to expire so that they could weigh in before they became renewed. I understand that, but my concern is uh, that the nursing home board uh, be made aware of new contracts that are not renewals, but entirely new contracts because um, my take from uh, being at these meetings that there's what, 60 or 80 contracts that Over the 80. nursing home board was not aware that existed, and I think that's an important factor for the board to have knowledge about. I'm not saying taking action, just knowledge, and this is all after the fact. I'm not sure we're reading this the same way. Uh, Deb, do you want to your want to weigh in on this? New contracts typically come to the nursing home board for approval as with the issue with the dietary services at last night's meeting. What the, what the intent here is that all contracts shall be reviewed with the nursing home board in August of each year with um, specific, you know, schedule for renewal including the type of competitive procurement that will be used for the renewal which should result in um, 
establishing schedules for those renewals, particularly if it's going to be a bid or an RFP, so that the board can see when those contracts come due. It's not that dissimilar with what you know the county board has if you look at the listing of contracts on the website and when they expire and, and bringing them to you for renewals. The idea was to focus on it so that the nursing home board is aware of it, um, but I do believe that contracts that are new are brought to the nursing home board. Okay, then at one last point of clarification, then uh, why was the nursing home board not aware of this plethora of contracts? If they because coming... this hasn't been done in the past. They I mean, haven't been being brought This before. listing of providing all of the contracts that the nursing home is engaged in hasn't been done in the past, provided to the nursing home board as information so that they would know when these contracts need to be renewed. Some of these contracts are ongoing and just explaining what they all are. And I don't fully understand all the contracts either, which is why the intent here is that they all be reviewed with the nursing home board in August of every year. Thank you. I mean, if I can follow up on that, I think, I think the, the reason that this is included is, I mean, I can't speak to why an individual member of the nursing home board would or would not have taken an interest in a particular vendor contract, but even if vendor contracts are brought to the nursing home board, there was not a unified, there was not a process by which the whole list was essentially brought to the board on a periodic basis, and that was what, this was not intended to replace any existing board oversight. This was intended to add to MPA's responsibility that they make sure that the board is aware of those con contracts in totality. I mean, I, I guess a comparable way to look at it would be the county board approves contracts, but I don't think there's a single county board member who can probably identify every vendor contract that the county has in place. So this was an attempt to add additional add additional communication with the nursing home board rather than uh, to change the, the re re remove authority. Uh, now, Mr. Kibler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to abstain from voting as uh, immediate family is in direct competition with the nursing home. Uh, Mr. Carter. I haven't uh, heard yet that this previous board, I can't believe nobody's questioned that board by this performance of the last since they've been there. I don't see any improvement that they made. I'm living in there now, and I give you hands on a lot of things that I see. I just don't believe that. That you sit here and say you don't have a problem with that board. Um, are you talking about the nursing home board? Yeah. Well, we have a couple of members on the county board who are members of the nursing home board and who are a lot closer to this than, than I am on a, a daily basis. Well, I'm living in there right now, and I have hands on, and I'm just being fair. I'm not. The, the I'm board, not... That, that facility is in shambles. With a lot of, you don't have no sense of direction who's responsible for what. I'm serious. I, I, under, I can hear what you're saying, Mr. Carter. Well, I'm just, nobody's saying that, you know, we should see what attention that board have to proving their performance. I guess that's all right. Uh, wait, who are really serious about that nursing home? I like that question. Who can tell me that they are really serious to see that facility progress and, 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 and be approved? I have all this bull job, but I don't see no... <laughs> oh, man, this is ridiculous. I don't see any uh, improvement at all. And we keep it going down that same road. Now, we, we need to get serious. We, 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 we promised the taxpayers that we were going to look at that, you know, keep that facility working properly, and we're not doing that. And I'm just saying, give you my truly opinion that I'm living there and see every day what's going on. 
I appreciate your comments, Mr. Carter. I, I hear you. Uh, other comments or questions? Well, you Mr. Had Carter. Suddenly we had four cooks trying to feed one, two, four. Yeah, I think it's four dining room, right? And probably 50 more people than each dining room. Now you tell me how in the world can that happen? Three cooks. The food is cold by the time they get it out there. And it's, and it's not the, the cook's problem. If you have a general and no soldier, you don't have no, <laughs> I don't see how you're going to run things. And that's a fact, you all. I'm not make this is a fact. And I don't know how to pull, no wonder they quit. I don't know how in the world you expect for anybody. <laughs> I don't know how they do it myself, really. They are trying, but it's sad. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, Mr. Hartke. Um, well, I can inform the board that last night the nursing home board of directors voted to bring on a new uh, food service management company one that has an extremely good record with all the references we checked, one that has over 24 sites that it maintains in the state of Illinois. This week, both the, direct, the regional and di uh, district director for this company were on site, uh, one of whom is committed to stay on site until we have a full management staff in place, uh, evidently to the point where these gentlemen were, had their suits off and were washing dishes the other day. Their goal right now is sanitation. First step, have clean, uh, edible food. Second step will be the service issues. They are going to work on some methods to get food out faster. Uh, one additional thing is that the, the heated carts that we have had on order for an extended period of time, the manufacturer had problems getting some of their materials but neglected to tell us that they had the 36 tray racks available and we had ordered the 24 and they were on hold. So those should be coming this Thursday is my report. That's going to help us a lot with getting food out to the dining rooms a lot faster. So I do have to say that I believe the nursing home board is dealing with these issues. Of course, things do not get fixed in a day's notice, and nothing will ever be perfect. But I think we are dealing with these issues as they come forward. Um, we have run into problems, but I don't think that those are due to neglect by the board. And I think that hopefully this new food service company will help us improve some things, as will getting all the equipment that we purchased in-house. Thank you, Mr. Harkey. Anybody else? Mr. Maxwell. Um, Mr. Harkey did a very good job of updating us on the food service. Um, I have visited uh, Mr. Carter several times in the last couple weeks at the home, and much of, I don't disagree with anything he's saying. I think we're all aware that we do have problems. They're not only a problem within the home, but they're an industry-wide problem. And uh, the Board of Directors is beginning to, I think, has taken a more proactive state uh, strategy in trying to get these things resolved. The new contract uh, language does uh, give us a little bit more uh, control over getting the management in place. Uh, the last meeting we had, uh, last night's meeting, we, the Board of Directors specifically charged MPA to come back with some uh, recommendations for sol and solutions for employee turnover, recruiting, vacant management positions, and employee accountability. I don't think we can, uh, we're not going to solve these problems overnight. We have made some improvements over the last several years. We've no longer have quite the fiscal disaster we had. Um, as long as the state doesn't uh, cut back on the, uh, or increases, pardon me, increases the uh, time that we have to wait for uh, payments uh, and uh, some other things that, and even though uh, the, the Senate bill, I think it's 741, may give us some additional money, I don't think we can spend it just yet because I don't think it's here and it could be a while in coming. But we're making those 
moves as, as a board of directors to make MPA more accountable and to put some uh, procedures in place that should improve food service, uh, hopefully in the near future, very near future. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Any other comments or questions? Uh, hearing none, I'll make one of my own. Uh, I just want to thank uh, those who participated in the negotiation of this contract, uh, especially Mr. Harkey and Mr. Maxwell and uh, Ms. Busey and Mr. Anderson uh, and uh, uh, representatives of MPA. Uh, we've been hearing for a while now, you know, since we, we started hearing monthly about the nursing home on the finance agenda, I feel like there's been some more discussion about the types of issues that Mr. Carter's bringing up. I just want to make the point, this contract is a framework but there are a thousand decisions every day that are made at the nursing home that can't be itemized in any contract. Uh, we, I believe, have a strong partner in MPA. We have a strong partner in the union. And I think I, I'm glad to hear that Mr. Harkey and Mr. Maxwell feel like the nursing home board of directors is taking a somewhat more aggressive stand, is, is, is looking more at getting involved in the day-to-day -day decisions as far as you know, identifying problems and making sure that they get fixed. I certainly hope that happens because there's no contract that we could write that would cause any specific problem in the nursing home to be fixed without the continuous oversight of the nursing home board. So I want to thank the members of that board and encourage them to do everything that they can to you know, grab the reins and make sure that we uh, continue to improve the quality of the nursing home. Other comments or questions? All those in favor of sending this to the, uh, Ms. Bergson, sorry. You want to speak? Okay. For three years, I've been saying the same thing. That what you want at the nursing home is the people who can choose whether or not to go there, mainly the Medicare and the self-pays. And you've got to improve the food uh, because that counts with them. If they have a choice, they're not going to go and eat garbage or eat cold food and sit for an hour and a half waiting for it. And the, I think the census problems would be solved to a considerable extent, as in addition to some of the others, if you got the food management problem straight. And in three years, it does not seem to have improved at all. Thank you, Ms. Berkson. I think our nursing home representatives heard you. Mr. Carter, sir. No, I, I appreciate them, and I'm not bad, Ma. But if I'm going to sit there and not, I put my butt on the line when we, when we build that. Everybody said, go out and sell it. Go out and sell it. We got to sell it. And we did. Now, the taxpayers are looking for us. Hear what I'm saying. If you had somebody performing for you, how long that board been there? I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, the nursing home how board? Long, yeah, how long that board been established? About six years. And have showed any? Come on, folks. I don't know how you can trust somebody with your money like that. Well, Mr. Carter, one of them is sitting right next to you, and I think that they have said their piece tonight, as have you. <laughs> well, oh, Mr. Carter, I don't know what you want. I don't know what you want me to tell you. I think we've heard your dissatisfaction, and the board members have, have under, understood what you've said some of the problems are, and hopefully there'll be a effort to look at it. But I don't, I don't, you're looking at me. I don't know what you want me to tell you, sir. <laughs> well, I just like my granddad. It looked like to me you putting the fox back in the hen house. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Any further discussion, comments, or questions? I uh, will address the issue that Ms. Petrie brought up, make sure that, that the intent of the of that paragraph was satisfied. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. That motion carries. Give me a minute here to update my consent. Okay, we'll move on now. Uh, the state's attorney, Julie Reitz, is here and has been very patiently waiting. Uh, she has a presentation to give us on some existing uh, Programs that work with juveniles in Champaign County and the funding conditions and potential additional funding sources for those programs. So the floor is yours, Julia. Uh, first of all, I'm not here Microphone, you. please. Microphone. I thought I just I turned it on, Julia. You got to turn it on. Thank you. I'll still talk really loud. Okay, so first of all, I'm not here to ask you to do anything. 
Yay. There will be no vote. We are just here to give you information, which some of you may already know about, but um, I think we spend a lot of time in this room and um, throughout county government talking about programming, um, hoping to provide appropriate programming. You heard from Peter Tracy about um, some programming that's funded by the Mental Health Board. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you about some programs that have existed, um, some for many, many years in Champaign County that work primarily with um, young people, with children that serve victims, child victims of crimes, as well as um, children who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and these programs are designed to help them um, through the crisis, help them through the process, and hopefully um, set them on the right path so that they can move forward either um, from the difficult situation that they found themselves in or that was created for them, or from um, the situation that they created for themselves. And the reason why we wanted to bring um, these programs to your attention is because in one way or another, they are funded by Champaign County and um, through this board. And so I'm not asking, we're not here today to ask you to do anything, but merely to give you some information um, and so that we can keep the fact of these programs and their needs in mind as you move forward in the budgeting process. Um, because just because I'm not ask, here to ask for anything today, that doesn't mean that we're not going to come back um, in the future and ask for something. So I thought it would be best to, to you know, introduce the topic, and then later, um, when we're really in, meshed in the budgeting process, if we believe it's appropriate to ask, we can ask, and you've already got that background about these programs. Um, I have with me today Rush Record, who's the director of the Champaign County CASA program. That's Court Appointed Special Advocates. And I see many nods, so that's good. That means people are aware of that wonderful program. And he's going to talk about um, that program. And Lieutenant Bryant Serafin from the Urbana Police Department is here to help me talk with you about the Children's Advocacy Center, as well as the Youth Assessment Center that you heard a little bit about from Peter Tracy. And Jane Quinlan is in the back of the room hiding. She is the um, from the um, Regional Office of Education, and she's also on the board of the Children's Advocacy Center and is here um, in support of that program. So um, those are the three programs that I wanted to talk with you a bit about, and you should have a lot of information that I provided um, to Mrs. Busey um, in your packets about a little bit about, I believe, just the CAC and the Youth Assessment Center, and Rush is going to talk about CASA with you. So I'll start out talking, of, and again, as I said, all of these programs are in one way or another funded um, in some way by Champaign County. Now, you have in your packets information that I um, summarized about a fee, and the document looks like this, and it's titled Additional Fees to Finance the Court System. Again, I'm not asking for any decisions to be made, but I'm giving you information. There is a statute that provides you, the county board, with the ability to create fees that are added on in criminal cases and traffic cases to support various different um, programs. You already have that fee for drug court. And so there's a $5 fee that's added on in every criminal case and traffic case that goes to court to support our Champaign County Drug Court program. That same statute that allows that fee also includes fees for things such as children's advocacy centers, for CASA, for youth diversion programs like the Youth Assessment Center. And I've listed for you what the guidelines of those fees are um, and how much they can be, what they cover, all of that sort of thing. In you know, classic legislative fashion, they're all a little bit different for some reason. Some, you know, minimum of five, some's 10 to 30. Don't know why there's a difference, but there is. And so that's a summary of those fees. And again, we're not asking for you to do anything about it today, but to keep in mind that you do already use that fee to fund drug court, and that there are many counties throughout the state 
that use that fee to help support their programs such as children's advocacy centers or CASAs or youth assessment centers and that sort of thing. When I gave you a little bit of information, thanks to Mrs. Busey and to Rush, um, showing you what other counties do as far as providing those fees. So you can see that in Peoria County, they use the full extent of the CAC fee, the $30, um, whereas in Sangamon it's 10, in McLean County it's 15. Um, and so those are possibilities for you to consider. And then I also gave you a very, very rough estimate of what those kinds of fees could do for us financially for these types of programs. And that's a very rough estimate because you know, it's a question of what cases actually are convictions, what is actually collectible. Um, so I can't really say, if you do this, then X amount will result. But it's a rough estimate, um, and so that's what, what that information is. Again, not asking you to do anything, but let's keep it in mind as we move forward in the budgeting process. Um, I think it's very appropriate to consider that because these fees are um, on cases where um, people have involved themselves in the criminal justice system and they support, again, children who are victimized during the course of that process. And so I think that's the thought process legislatively. So the Children's Advocacy Center, um, you have, again, a lot of information in your packets and I'm not really going to go over it too greatly in depth but because I'm sure you've all read it. And there's a number of News Gazette articles also, um, the News Gazette has been wonderful in covering that agency and its successes, and we very much appreciate um, the public notice. The Children's Advocacy Center is where we bring children who are victims of sexual abuse or serious phys physical abuse to be interviewed in a child safe environment. Um, it is staffed by our director, Adelaide Amy, who is on vacation, otherwise she would be here. And she's done a wonderful job in raising independent funds. As you see, there's an article about how we redid the playroom using donations from the public. Um, we had to go out and ask people to give us money so that we could repaint and refresh the toys and all of that sort of thing because we simply don't have money for that in our budget. And she's done a wonderful job of doing that. We also have um, Elaine Mitchell who works directly with the families she meets them as they come in and bring the children in. She um, makes referrals for them to other kinds of counseling. And we have contracts also for, con for counselors who work directly with the children after the interview process um, to help them through the crisis that they're in and are available even years down the road. And we've had situations where years down the road, children as they grow, go through this trauma in a different way, come back to the CAC for assistance and help. And then we also now have a interviewer, a forensic, forensic interviewer on staff, and I'll have um, Lieutenant Serafin talk with you a little bit more about how much that has helped the criminal justice process from law enforcement perspective. Our interviewer is funded completely by uh, money that was gifted by the University of Illinois. And um, this is money that was um, divided up between the Big Ten schools from the Jerry Sandusky situation. And it is money that the Big Ten schools get from NCAA um, tournaments, from the bowl, bowl games, basically. And so we are one of the organizations that gets that money. The United Way is managing it and they've divided it up between four agencies, one of those being CAC, another being CASA. And we have used that money to hire a forensic interviewer. That money um, is, will end in four years, well in three years. We've had it for a year, it's been renewed this year, it will definitely end in four years. It might end next year. Every year it's a question of whether we're gonna get it, and every year it's a question of how much we're going to get. Um, so hopefully Big Ten schools in the bowl games, because the more <laughs> Big Ten money in, in bowl games, the more there is to divide up. And then of course there's the question of now that there's two other schools in the Big Ten, are they gonna get the money too? You know, so it's, it's not a firm commitment for an exact amount for four years. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to continue 
with this um, having this staff member who it, the point of it is to have one person who's specially trained in doing these interview child friendly interviews and when you're talking about children who are victims of sexual abuse the interviewing process um, is so important you cannot lead them you can't put thoughts in their heads or words in their mouths and you have to be um, very careful and very aware of what they've gone through as you're going through the interviewing process and we've lucky enough to get this money and also at the same time to have a champagne police officer who did their interviews primarily retire and so she was very happy to then take on this position as a, as a job after she retired from Champagne. It's been a wonderful transition. And so um, that money is limited and is part of the reason that we're coming to you um, so that you can keep that in mind as we move forward. And I'll let Lieutenant Serafin talk a little bit about that and how that's affected um, local law enforcement. You can jump in. If any board members have comments or questions, feel free to let me know. And otherwise, I know you guys like microphones. I heard yeah, that earlier. Otherwise, continue. So. It's more, more for the folks at home than for us, assuming somebody's actually watching. Uh, my name is Bryant Serafin. I am the lieutenant in charge of the uh, investigations division at the Urbana Police Department. And I got that job back in March of 2007. And I tell you that because Julia asked if I would speak to the law enforcement perspective on the Children's Advocacy Center and you've read about it in the papers and you've heard a little bit tonight, but I'll tell you why it's important. In March of 2007, I was taking over my new job. The retiring lieutenant is emptying his office and putting things in his boxes and saying, hey, just so you know, there's a couple of detectives in there. They're interviewing a parent. Something about some school teacher might have been inappropriate with some children. His name was John White. That's why we need the CAC. Um, we ran through over 30 children through that facility in that particular case. Detectives, uh, DCFS investigators all participated in conducting those interviews. Uh, an exhausting case to work on. It's the only time in my supervisory career at the police department where I ever had an officer come up to me and say, I don't care about what other case you want to give me please don't make me work on this anymore. I'll work the forgeries, I'll work the robberies, I'll work the shootings. I don't want to work this case anymore. That's why this is important. Um, as Julia already talked about, there are um, currently, there was a uh, multidisciplinary team effort to interview these children. We would get new detectives, we'd send them off to a week of training, DCFS would do the same. And uh, by having a consistent investigator or consistent forensic interviewer on staff, that takes some of that burden off of us. Um, clearly, the ability of the CAC to coordinate services. As police, we work on the investigation. We can write search warrants and interview suspects and locate people and evidence. But working on counseling isn't exactly our forte. The CAC does that. Um, I, more concrete things in addition to the, the, the forensic interviewer who's doing the interview so the police can take notes and start planning and doing other follow-up things. Um, the closed circuit digital video recording system is something that will need to be replaced. Um, and I think that might be in your packet somewhere as far as a cost estimate. But those are the kinds of things that we foresee being able to use uh, funds like this on. And uh, I guess that's the law enforcement perspective. <laughs> Yes, and thank you for adding that about the, the recording system. Um, we have, one of the things that comes out of the CAC is that we record the interviews of the children. We cannot use them in court without the child having to testify, but we can use them in support of the child's testimony. And they also help us on the prosecution side um, to be able to show the defense attorney, this is what you're facing. Um, look at this very vivid portrayal of this situation um, on video. Our video system is about 10 years old. It had an eight year useful life. So it could break down at any moment. And our funding is very, it's generally grant, grant funded and it's very focused to particular things and none of that is replacing the video system. So at some point that's going to have to happen. So the CAC is a county department um, and it 
takes advantage of and appreciates very much support from in the financial area of the county, from accounting, from payroll, from benefits, all of that sort of thing. But it doesn't cost you a anything. You don't pay, you don't have an actual dollar amount going into it from general corporate funds. And so as we go forward in the budget process, the fee is an option or perhaps considering actually funding some portion of it, perhaps considering putting some of that capital improvement into county dollars um, might be something that you might look at. And I would also add that the local police agencies also pay in um, to help support the CAC on a voluntary basis. We basically ask them to give us some money and they give us what they can give us out of their budget because they do get a great benefit from that agency. And so that's, um, I think, generally what I wanted to let you know about the CAC and the funding issues involved there as we go forward. And certainly, if you want to ask any questions about that particular agency at this time, we can do that, or we can just take any questions at the end, whatever's easiest. Uh, I don't see any hands, so let's go on to the Youth Assessment Center. Okay, well, I'm going to stop talking and let Rush talk okay. about CASA a little bit as well. Um, and I'll try really hard not to interrupt him. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's, it's nice to be in a room full of people that shake their heads when we ask about CASA because that means we're doing a little bit of our job and increasing the awareness of what we do. I love talking about what CASA does, and, and we're here for the victims of, of the John Whites of Champaign County. Um, any child that is abused and neglected that comes into the court system uh, comes through our office. We are the contracted guardian ad litem for all abused and neglected kids in the Champaign County court system. As of today, we're serving over 420 kids that are in this court system. The very unique thing about the CASA organization is we're largely volunteer-based. We have 100, over 130 individuals, much like yourselves, who have gone through our training program who donate their time to us to advocate on behalf of these kids. So what our volunteers are doing are the working side by side with the social service agencies here in Champaign County and actually outside of Champaign County. Um, we have about 230 cases which make up those 400 kids and about 25% of those cases or those children are not placed here in Champaign County because of a lack of available foster homes. Because we're the guardian ad litem and we're contracted by the county, we have to meet state statute in regards to time frames when we can visit these children. So our volunteers are driving to the Collar Counties, to Chicago, uh, to far southern Illinois, and honestly to a couple other states to see these kids, to make sure that we uh, lay eyes on the kids, make sure that they're appropriately placed, that they're in a safe environment and they're being well cared for. Our volunteers have logged about 15,000 miles this fiscal year. We've done over 850 visits. Our attorneys, because we're a guardian ad litem, we have actually three attorneys now working out of our office that solely practice abuse and neglect court. They don't do anything else. So their knowledge when they walk into the courtroom really is second to none. Those attorneys have appeared over 800 times in the court system this fiscal year. We can't do this for free. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We've been around for 20 years, so we're celebrating our 20th year. We fundraise slightly over 50% of our budget. So my role is extremely unique. I'm a fundraiser one day and a social worker the next. And so uh, as part of the 31 CASA organizations in the state of Illinois, um, about 14 of them have taken an opportunity to impose a fee so far. Our Illinois CASA organization was very beneficial in getting this legislation passed. And we are seeing a, an increased workload. Um, as you, I'm sure you've read, the social system, social system in Illinois is overburdened. Um, they're underfunded. It is not unique for the CASA, the volunteer, to be the constant person in this child's life. Many times our CASA volunteer will call an agency, speak to the caseworker, and two months later find that that caseworker has left. Many times we have cases that are in the court system two years, three years, and they've gone through four or five caseworkers and had the one constant CASA worker. So that's why we're here. We're here for those kids to not fall through the cracks, to speak up for their best interests, to make sure that their needs are met, to make sure that the proper services are being um, implemented for them. The nice part about being a nonprofit and not being attached to 
a state budget or a state agency is that we can question why services have not been in place. We can say, why is a child not getting counseling? Why are they on a waiting list for four or six months? Why is this not happening? We've been very fortunate to have very positive support from the judges. Um, they value what we do. They call our CASAs by name. They've given us tasks to do that sometimes are out of our realm of what we really should be doing, but they want answers, and that's what we're here to do. So we just appreciate, first of all, giving us the GAL contract for so many years, providing us that support, and considering um, possibly implementing a fee later on down the road. And this is the part where I interrupt you, or add on. I add on. I add on. So Rush talked about the GAL contract, and so you're aware and clear what he means by that. Um, the court system has various contracts with um, to support things outside of my office, the public defender's office, that sort of thing. One of those contracts is um, to have a guardian ad litem. So the court system has, um, I think it's $36,000 a year, right? Um, that there's, and so there's two contracts for 36,000 a year each that the court system has given to, um, entered into with CASA to provide those guardian ad litem services. That could be, they could do that with any lawyer. It could be a private lawyer, it could be you know, a, a law firm. The court system, the judges have chosen CASA to serve that function and um, the CASA lawyers then appear in court. And those contracts have remained static for ever, $36,000 a year. Um, that doesn't cover benefits, that doesn't cover travel expenses, that doesn't cover office expenses. Um, so it's been flat for a long time. And, and so- Julia, if I can interrupt, just so I want to make sure everybody understands. The guardian ad litem is, a, is, is what? The guardian ad litem represents the child um, in court. And the way it works is that CASA has lawyers who represent the child in court and then has volunteers who are assigned to the family um, and who stay with the case throughout the course of the case. And so it's really a two-tiered approach, um, which I think really benefits the child. I don't, I don't want to sound like too much of an advocate here, but about 20 years ago I sat in a dark, your dusty hot classroom in Lincoln Square, in Lincoln uh, Hall on campus, and I heard then Judge DeLamar explain this concept of this new program that they were, you know, he was trying to get off the ground. And the way he described it was if you have a, a child, so for example, not a sexual abuse, but a child neglect case, and you've got an ugly divorce, and you go to court, and they're fighting over the kid, and mom's got a lawyer, and dad's got a lawyer, well, the kid hasn't got a lawyer, and that's something that stuck with me. And with the GAL concept, which of course has been around a long time, that's the judge appointing a lawyer for the kid, so the kid at least has representation. But CASA is about not only the kid having a lawyer, but the kid actually having an advocate who is there to essentially make sure that the kid doesn't slip through the cracks in these types of proceedings. So I just wanna be sure I understood what the, what the role was. Exactly right. Right. And, and the other thing that makes us unique is our advocates have an opportunity to write a report to the court and actually make a recommendation to the judge to what they think should happen in this case. And there is no other organization that does that. We're the sole organization that focuses solely on the child. It's not to say we don't advocate for family reunification when it's appropriate, but we solely focus on the best interest of the child. There's so many of these kids that as you can imagine, have come from horrendous backgrounds and have experienced something in their young lives that no one should ever have to experience. And our role is to make sure, to the best of our ability, to make sure that those services are put in place so that we can hopefully end the cycle of abuse and get these kids off to a, to a better start when they're outside of the court system. Okay, and so I can say also, the CASA lawyers are in court for, again, for what you're paying them. <laughs> you're getting a really good deal. If you sat down and broke it down to an hourly rate, I don't know if it would even make minimum wage, quite honestly. Um, it's certainly a lot less than I pay my attorneys, and they are in court full-time, full-time, on very difficult, gut-wrenching cases. And so 
Um, so keep this in mind again as you go forward. Finally, um, I want to talk with you a little bit about the Youth Assessment Center that you've heard a bit about from Peter and hopefully again you've seen um, in the News Gazette and on television. I'm not just talking about the News Gazette because Tom's here, but they've done a wonderful job of covering um, this wonderful new center that has opened just in the past year. This is something that we've been talking about in um, the criminal justice system partners for a very long time. It's been a vision that we've had and um, it was able to come to bricks and mortar just in the past year because um, through the funding of the quarter cent sales tax, juvenile delinquency prevention money, and, and through a very generous donation um, by the Champaign School Board, um, giving us basically the actual facility on Randolph Street to house this, um, this organization. The, the Youth Assessment Center is a referral source. So kids are brought into the center, either directly by law enforcement at the time of a situation or through a referral. And the counselors at the assessment center contact the family and get them in, get them to come in, and they sit down and do an evaluation of the young person and of the family and of the issues, and then they make referrals to them, um, for them, and follow up on those referrals and make sure they've been actually um, followed up on and gone through. And the process is basically under the statute, it's a formal station adjustment. The purpose of it is to keep the kid out of the criminal justice system. And if they successfully complete what they've been referred to through the assessment center, then the report doesn't come to my office, there are no charges filed, and hopefully they move forward with the knowledge that they've gained um, and don't make those <laughs> bad decisions again. The assessment center to date, well, we opened in about June of last year, um, to date, they've had 455 referrals from, um, of kids throughout Champaign County. Most of them have been the city of Champaign. Um, the second highest number would be the city of Urbana and the county. But kids throughout Champaign County. And it is an alternative to bringing a kid to the youth detention center where it's a locked facility and an introduction into the court system. And so officers are actually bringing kids to the assessment center rather than bringing them to the detention center. And then the staff there are referring them on to a variety of local service organizations and keeping the situation a local, um, community-based, problem-solving model. So this is a wonderful new organization that uh, we're very proud of. And again, I'll ask um, Lieutenant Serafin to talk a little bit about it again from law enforcement perspective, uh, because this really has been a collaborative effort between the justice system, law enforcement, and the local um, service organizations um, in order to create this great, this great system and this great situation um, to help our young people make better decisions. The, uh Youth Assessment Center, like she said, has been a concept for a while, and it's come together in pieces slowly over time. Um, I can recall several years ago we would, uh, when we would arrest juveniles for fairly low-level things and shoplifting and, and those types of uh, situations or running around and traipsing through Mrs. McGillicuddy's flowers, we would, we would take these children and the juvenile detention center didn't want them and so we'd try to get them and take them home and then we'd try to get them to come back so that we as police could try to put them on the station adjustment, this sort of um, probation type contract. And we would have different groups within the community come to us and say, I have, let me, I, I can work with your youth. And no, we have, a, I got a grant somewhere, I will work with your youth. And we as the police, as you remember from what I just said, aren't very good at those kinds of things. And the Youth Assessment Center, this concept solves that problem for us. Um, we have somewhere to take children who have, or, or youth who have, uh, committed these sort of low-level crimes. We have somewhere to go with them so they don't go to the juvenile detention center. We can still take them home. 
depending on the circumstances and make the referral later. Um, and sometimes that situation's even dictated by other factors like calls for service and manpower at the time. Um, but the Youth Assessment Center does a lot for us even after our initial contact. We have one juvenile investigator at Urbana Police Department who specializes in this area. And with that center, they are able to help monitor these children, help to make sure they're um, fulfilling their ends of their contracts. And if they're not, they will address it at the youth assessment center level. So it, it, the, I asked my juvenile investigator yesterday about this before I came here, and he loves the program because it allows him, um, it frees him up from so much uh, of this monitoring and this type of work. So uh, it, we continue to use it and um, are, are very glad that it's uh, available. So that, the Youth Assessment Center, again, is funded primarily through quarter cent sales tax money. The, court youth, the juvenile court diversion program funds that you specifically set aside. And um, again, a very generous donation from the Unit 4 school board for the facility. And in the past couple of months, the school board said, well, we might want to sell that building because it's right in downtown Champaign, which is a great location for this facility. Uh, but obviously a pretty prime location for real estate, for the real estate people, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so, um, and so we understand that. They, we went to the board and said, please give us some more time. They have extended that through another year, uh, which again is very generous of them. We're not paying any rent. But at some point, we're going to have to make a decision. And that decision is probably going to require funds unless we can find another space that's free. And the space is really important because we don't wanna send these kids to the detention center. We don't wanna do this out of a police department, out of a government building. It's a, um, the point is supposed to be, again, a friendly, comforting, welcoming environment. And you're welcome to go stop by there on Randolph Street um, and visit. It's a really nicely, um, laid out space, the um, Regional Planning Commission people did a great job of turning it into a very welcoming environment. I know some of you have stopped by there in the past, um, but the space issue is going to come to a head in the next year or so, and so the funding question is going to um, be, be prime on our minds. And so again, you can use the fee to help that, or that might be a question that we look at four quarter cent sales tax money, although Mrs. Busey doesn't want me to say that, um, <laughs> or some other way. But it's an issue that you should be aware of. Um, and again, I, I wanted to bring these three specific programs to your attention because I think in a way they fly under the radar somewhat, um, but they are so, some of them very established, others of them new, but all of them doing wonderful work for the children of our community. And they absolutely deserve um, your attention your concern, your financial support, um, and your awareness. And so if you have any questions for any of us, we're happy to answer them. And again, I invite you to go visit both the Children's Advocacy Center or the Youth Assessment Center if you haven't already been there. Any comments or questions? Ms. Petrie. Um, I need to be reminded, is the Youth Assessment Center 24-7? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it is not 24-7 at this time, that is, a, um, that was something that was an ideal end goal, but again, for funding, um, staffing issues, and also looking at the time frames that we really need it to be open, um, that's something that's constantly being considered. So it's open until um, 10 p.m. some nights, until midnight some nights, um, based on kind of the time frames when children are, or young people are out and getting involved with law enforcement. May I have a follow-up question? You certainly may. Um, <clears throat> then uh, what are the alternatives for uh, the police when they are engaged with some youth that is, uh, needs attention and it's past midnight or two in the morning since the goal is to keep them out of the JD Center? Well, first of all, certainly if a young person is committing an offense that requires incarceration, they're going to the detention center. And, that, and, um, and so what, whatever time of the day it is. But we sat down and really looked at the times where young people, and by young people I mean people under the age of 18, 
are or were being um, engaged with law enforcement, and that led to then the time frames that the center is opened. Um, and so you really see a serious drop in activity, let's say after midnight, really nothing good happens after 2 a.m. out there. Um, but, but generally, young, the, the hours are um, really more probably 10 a.m. Um, into the evening hours when you're seeing activity involving young people. And um, the schools, the school resource officers are bringing kids directly from um, the schools to the youth assessment center rather than to the detention center. And that's an issue that's being discussed um, right now in the Champaign School District. Mr. McGuire. Yeah, and that was one of the things I was gonna add. Um, I guess first, thank you for all the work you're doing and the volunteers. I don't, it would be difficult for me to be involved in these programs, especially CAS and CAC. I'm on the Community Action Board, so I have some experience with youth assessment program, and it is successful. I mean, if we can put the police officers back on the street faster, and those kids have more of an opportunity, all the kids that we're talking about, at, maybe at, at life, even, you know, you. You never know how many numbers. Everybody says, how much money does this cost? How much, which, you know, are these programs helpful? You know, for the parent that has a child that's struggling in, in school or in their classroom and the other, other kids that are around them, you know, if you turn around that child, you know, the parent would say that's, that's success. But some of the numbers that we're seeing in some of these programs are really very high, you know, 50 or 60%. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was talking about not want to be an advocate, but I would like to be an advocate because let's, you know, let's support something that obviously for 20 years has worked and, and helped kids. And, and kids, of course, in CASA, we need to be there for those kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Mr. Kurtz. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank uh, Julia and the gentleman from CASA and the police officer. Uh, I've been a mentor in the Unifor schools for seven years and my two sons went to the schools. And I remember back in the, in the old days, because my sons are long out of school now, um, the problems that used to occur at Central and Edison and those schools, uh, where this resource officer now uh, has put a stabilizing effect in those schools. And these diversion programs have really uh, done, them, and you can see the statistics uh, as, they, as they're reduced more and more in these schools. And, First, uh, I just hope that the Unifor School Board uh, renews these resource officers uh, and not put security guards in there. That's a different animal completely from a resource officer, um, a police officer in the schools. Um, and the, uh, the work that you're doing, uh, I have to congratulate you, particularly CASA. The, it's such a burnout type of a situation. So many people have wanted to work and, and they just it's a difficult, difficult, emotional job uh, to work with these youngsters, and um, I have to congratulate you and thank you for all the efforts you've done. Thanks, Al. Uh, any other comments? If not, I know this has been a long presentation, so I was going to ask you to take a minute. I'll ask you to take 30 seconds and mention Peer Court. <laughs> Peer Court is part of what? Did you want to? No. Okay. Peer Court is part of the Youth Assessment Center program. Um, and so one of the recommendations that the counselors can make to a young person who is referred to the assessment center is that they go through the peer court program. And the, um, that is a program where other young people um, come in. The, the child, ha the subject of the peer court has to, it's not a court in the sense of a finding of guilty or that sort of thing. The kid has to first admit that they've done whatever it is they're accused of doing. And then they, there's a presentation made, the jurors, peer court jurors are um, allowed to see the police report. They're allowed to ask questions of their peer, and then they make a decision about what needs to be done as far as public service work, or restitution, or counseling, or you know, a letter of apology, all different kinds of options that they have. But the concept is that young people relate to each other better than they relate to you and I, and so they respond better um, to each other. And so that we do have a peer court, peer jury process that's run out of the Youth Assessment Center, and that's one of the referrals that can be made. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Uh, there's a reason 
I'll stress that this presentation was on the finance agenda and not the justice and social services agenda where it probably should have been, but these are programs that operate on shoestring budgets with a small number of people and are always strapped for money, so I guarantee you'll be hearing from me about some of these programs as we get into the budget process, so thank you for being here. Thanks for coming. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish the agenda. Thank you. All right, let's please take our seats. Let's take our seats, we'll continue on. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, they jump when I say something, don't they? <laughs> oh, I can do that, blow that floater. Plays a book. Yeah, it's off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're up to state's attorney animal control. Looks like. All right. Let's continue on. Uh, back in order. Thank you. Our next item is a request from Animal Control requesting approval of an intergovernmental agreement between the County of Champaign and the City of Champaign for animal impound services. I see a motion by Aaron to forward this to the full board with a recommendation for approval and a second by Mr. Hartke. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Do we actually have a quorum? We do. Okay, Ms. Court. In number three on page uh, 103, um, I thought that the, our last discussion about the operational hours was that we were going to keep the hours on Saturdays open, but I see it's crossed out. We're looking. This is, um, this is not about the hours of operation. The facility is still open on Saturdays. But this is reflecting probably anticipation that the facility may not be open on Saturdays. This is a one-year contract that starts on July 1st, and the city of Champaign had no objection to that. So we're, what you're saying is we're not saying the facility is going to be closed on Saturday. We're just saying we're not guaranteeing the city of Champaign that's going to be open on Saturday. It doesn't mean it's going to be closed on Saturday. I mean, it, as long as the county board keeps it open on Saturday, it will be open on Saturday. We're just not guaranteeing it in the contract, and the city of Champaign had no problem with that. It means that if we didn't, if we weren't open on Saturday, the city of Champaign would still have to pay, <laughs> essentially, right? Am I missing something? Ms. Michaels? Is there any reason why we wouldn't leave the contract the way it was? Instead I think of Ms. adding I, this I, language? I think Ms. Busey said so. It would give us the flexibility to close it on Saturday if the board decided to close it on Saturday. I mean, you can't close on Saturday without us telling them it's okay. okay. Anybody else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next item is from the Emergency Management Agency requesting approval of application requesting approval of the application for renewal and if awarded acceptance of the hazardous materials emergency preparedness planning grant. So moved. moved by Mr. Kurt, seconded by Mr. J. Uh, comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Uh, the sheriff has a similar Item requesting approval of a justice assistance grant program agreement between the city of Champaign and Champaign County. Moved by Mr. Stan James, seconded by Mr. Josh Hartke. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. We'll move on to the county administrator's report and the general corporate fund fiscal year 2014 budget projection and budget change reports. I would ask for a motion to accept these and place them on file. So moved. Uh, a whole lot of people, Second. Mr. Kurtz and Mr. and, and Ms. Berkson. How about that? Uh, Ms. Busey. Sounds good to me. Make a good team. The uh, budget projection report has not changed significantly from last month. Um, basically, uh, we probably, we're not seeing as much in terms of revenue growth 
from non-business licenses and permits as was anticipated and that um, correlates to recording fees. Um, the one cent sales tax is outperforming what we projected and the uh, general government fees are underperforming what we projected. Bottom line is we still look like we should achieve 99.75% of our revenue. On the expenditure side, um, we're underspending in just about every category except gas service and postage, um, which w brings us in with an anticipated final expenditure of about 97.5% of the budget, which gives us uh, much better than budgeted revenue to expenditure negative for the year at just $152,000 um, based on the current projections, which would still have us end the year with an almost 16% fund balance, which is fairly good. And the budget change report has not changed since last month. A comment to that, during the uh, recent courthouse tour for the facilities committee, which they allowed me to tag along on, uh, one of the comments uh, made in the circuit clerk's office was that one of the reasons that general government fees are down is agencies are writing fewer traffic tickets. Yeah. So we're collecting less in traffic ticket revenue. So. Not that I want to encourage unsafe driving, but uh, that's one of the reasons that we're seeing a decrease in those fees is uh, not as many tickets being written as, as used to be. Um, any comments or questions to Ms. Busey? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. The next item is uh, requesting approval of an engagement letter with William Blair to serve as an underwriter and advisor for Champaign County for potential bond refunding and bond issues. May have a motion to forward this to the, is this a full board item or is this just finance committee? Full board with a recommendation for approval. Mr. James, seconded by Mr. Schroeder. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. Uh, we now have the back half of the job content evaluation committee recommendations. Uh, we'll take the one for the county clerk training director position up first. We discussed this and acted on this already under policy and this is the financial portion of that. Uh, we would have to amend the salary schedule to accommodate those positions. May I have a motion for approval? Second. Moved by Mr. Langenheim, seconded by Mr. Kurtz. Any additional comments or questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. And second, we have the similar recommendation for the positions in administrative services. May I have a motion? Mr. Esri, may I have a second? Mr. Langenheim. Uh, additional comments, questions, or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, our last uh, significant item under finance is the county administrator's fiscal year 2014, fiscal year 2015 salary recommendation for non-bargaining employees, and I would ask that Ms. Michaels give us a closed session motion. Uh -oh. Sorry. I move we enter into closed session pursuant to 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C2 to consider salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. I further move that the following individuals remain present, the county administrator, deputy county administrator, and the recording secretary, and I call roll call. Thank you, and I will, may I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Harkey, and I will notify people in the, on the public who may be watching or people in the room that we will come back after the closed session and take action on this, so this is not, that we're not adjourning. Uh, will you please call the roll? Schrader? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Berkson? Yes. Carter? Yes. Carter? Yes. Cohort? Yes. Esri? Yes. Harper? Yes. Hartke? Yes. James? Yes. Jay? Yes. Kibler? Kurtz? Langenheim? Yes. Maxwell? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Michaels? Yes. Mitchell? Yes. Petrie? Yes. Quisenberry? No. Richards? Yes. Rosales? He's gone. And <laughs> Alex? Yes, the motion carries.
Deb is going to read a recommendation. Okay. Okay, we, we, we've got a quorum, so we'll move to, uh, we'll continue with uh, item I-6, the fiscal year 2015 salary recommendation for non-bargaining employees. And I would ask County Administrator Busey to read her recommendation. Um, I recommend that the Finance Committee uh, recommend to the County Board the non-bargaining salary schedule to be increased by 1.5% effective on January 1st, 2015 that all non-bargaining employees shall receive a 1.5% cost of living adjustment on January 1st, 2015, and that an additional 1% be allocated to the department heads to be distributed to individual employees based on merit and or compa ratio movement. Moved by Mr. Quisenberry, seconded by Mr. Kurtz, and with the understanding that nothing is final until the budget passes, all those in favor of sending this to the full board with a recommendation of approval, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I hear none. That motion carries. My last item is Mr. Quisenberry. Aye. Second. Well, if you don't like me that much, I'm happy not to show up. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? It'll, it will be done. Thank you. That concludes finance. Uh, consent, consent is uh, A2 and 3, G1, H1, I3, I4, I5, and I6. So, all in favor? 